All right, and welcome back. Well, it's time for us to now look at the dailies. And joining me to have that conversation is Brian Mutie, who is a governance expert. Good morning, and Good morning, thank you Mike. for joining us, Brian. Thank you, Mike. And straight, we're going to dig into the dailies this morning, and we start off with the standard, where the headline is Uhuru Raila name their unity team. And by the way, it's uh, also the same uh, um, headline on the nation. Uh, but let's start off with the standard. Uhuru Raila named their team, and there's a 14-member team that we have seen there made up of clergy and what would call mature Kenyans uh, over time that have been seen to be mature. And your thoughts, Brian, on this 14-member team? Absolutely. It's a mature team, Mike, as you rightly put it. And uh, I think uh, this is long overdue because this is one of the areas that uh, perhaps uh, has been an issue of concern when it comes to matters of national cohesion. And I think... Uh, this kind of action was in the right direction for the country to heal and to bridge the gaps that are, you know, have uh, exposed our vulnerabilities as a country. But I also want to say that uh, this seems to be a two-man sort of agreement to bring this kind of team on board, mm -hmm. uh, owing to the fact that we have other players who would, uh, would have also co uh, participated in terms of uh, contributing their members in terms of, uh, you know, this kind of formation, building mm -hmm. the bridges initiative. To me, it's a good, it's a good idea. But uh, when it comes to to look like it's a two, it's a political issue, then that's where the problem starts. Because mm -hmm. you ask yourself, where are the other uh, political players? If it's a political driven process, absolutely. And and well, what what makes you think it's driven by two men? Because now we have 14 men that they have chosen, mm -hmm. and they seem to be from different areas. We have clergy, we have politicians, we have those who possibly <coughs> are viewed as uh, people you know with vast knowledge of governance. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. I think uh, the composition, first of all, is, uh, is a good one, uh, save for some few gaps here, deficiencies. When it comes to youth representation, perhaps, you might find... Uh, the, as usual. The, as usual, there is a problem. <laughs> and you, you ask yourself, mm -hmm. where is the voice of the youth as usual? It mm -hmm. has always been missing in action. And therefore, it's a high time that the leadership of the day recognizes the place that the youth of the day uh, plays in, in shaping the politics of the day. Mm -hmm. Because they also have their own problems. They also experience their own problems in a special way. So it's uh, also important for them to be considered when it comes to national dialogue because they will also articulate those issues that they feel that need to be, you know, f uh, ironed or fine-tuned uh, in the interest of the youth of the day. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think it would have done better in terms of including maybe two, uh, you know, youth members who are below 35 perhaps to bring that uh, youth the voice agenda. Uh, voice on, Absolutely, on, on, Mike. The board. Yes, and yes. Uh, it's the same headline on the Daily Nation. Team reveals agenda of Uhuru Raila deal and it looks like, uh, well, there are those who are saying that uh, the handshake seems to have been fizzling out because they didn't have any uh, format, didn't have, uh, seem to have any uh, rules and regulations or even, uh, you know, like uh, any written document. But maybe now we can say possibly it's getting legs. Yeah, it is getting some shape, it's getting some color. And I was, uh, I'm on record here on KTN saying that uh, the unshake ought to have come at a time when they have already come up with some <coughs> pointers, like six, ten pointers that are, of course, of essence in this country. That should have been the basis under which now, you know, they would have now elected this team or nominated this team or formed this team to now deliberate upon those issues that they would have, uh, you know, addressed before the handshake came on board. Mm. But here we saw handshake and then uh, a team was actually behind the scenes crafted to come up with some issues that would be now the guiding principles in terms of the debate that will be, you know, uh, pointed towards creating a national cohesive country called Kenya. But to me, I think I think it's the right direction, all the same. It doesn't matter how the journey looks like. It doesn't matter the path that they are using, as long as the end result will be uh, resorting to national cohesion for this country to integrate better. All right, and uh, maybe you had a look at those names and we uh, highlighted them earlier on. Uh, maybe just to get your thoughts on uh, what your thoughts are on that. And the hashtag is Morning Express KTN. Uh, do let us know what you know on uh, those names. And you have Dr. Adam Zolo, Agnes Kavindu, Senator Amos Wako, Ms. Florence Amose, Professor Said Monguni. Um, uh, we, let's look at some more names that we have. Mze James Matundura. You have Major, that's retired. Major John Say, Bishop Lawi, uh, Imathew, 
Honorable Mason Leshomo and Senator Mohamed Yusuf Haji. Uh, we still have another four more names. Then you have Morompio Leronkai, Bishop Tenjenga, Honorable Rose Moseo, and Zacchaeus Okoth. What are your thoughts on those names? And uh, possibly uh, looking at that gentleman's agreement as it is known uh, through a handshake between Raila Odinga and Uhuru Kenyatta, basically seeming to gather shape and maybe structure and hopefully uh, give us some progress. But of course, like Brian has highlighted, uh, some of the leaders that one would have expected possibly left out, uh, but a gaping, um, missing uh, constituents is the youth, the young, not represented in that particular list. But then again, who knows, maybe this is just a starting point mm -hmm. and maybe the list will continue to grow as they go along. The chair of the team has not been selected yet mm -hmm. and I think it has been left to them uh, mm -hmm. to have uh, the chair selected, then have a two a member secretariat, uh, two leader secretariat basically leading the team. But there you go. Let's now look at page four of the standard. Let's go back to the standard and look at page four where we have uh, another issue that is of concern to Kenyans. And apparently, you are likely to get killed or robbed in 10 rich counties. Now, according to this particular article, they've uh, categorized and seen the 10 richest counties, as it were. But something that is also of interest is the fact that crime levels in those counties are the highest. And like you can see on that particular headline, you're likely to get killed in one of those 10 counties. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a direct correlation between, uh, you know, uh, poverty and, uh, you know, uh, urbanization. Because when you look at those counties where you find uh, that uh, the, 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 there are high cases of uh, crime or insecurity. You find that there are also some sort of informal settlements. The job uh, levels are very low. And uh, you realize that there is a direct correlation between these two. But again, it is also a wake-up call for us to see how we can synergize, how we can create a more robust police, uh, policing service that would ensure that the people's security is paramount. When you look at Kiambu uh, and Nairobi, for instance, uh, Michael, it, it goes without saying that. Um, the population itself is so high mm. and also the informal settlements are also high, uh, so many, and therefore the rate of unemployment also uh, has to be very high. And therefore the people who are idle, the youth who are idle looking for opportunities to, you know, uh, keep up with life are very minimal mm. owing to the fact that uh, job opportunities are very limited in this country. Mm -hmm. you, you look at Kiambu, the population of Kiambu is also very high. And also uh, the, the Meru, maybe, I don't know what we would articulate, uh, you know, attribute uh, crime levels in Meru with, mm -hmm. but maybe it, uh, because of Mira, maybe that could be one of the reasons. I'm not saying that it is a reason, but it could be. The other one is Nakuru, Mombasa, <coughs> Machako. These are highly, you know, populated uh, urban centers. And therefore you realize that uh, uh, it, it goes without saying that uh, crime levels has to be high. Would be high. And of mm. course, one of the things that would bring crime levels low mm. would be if there was opportunities and job employment in those particular counties, mm -hmm. if uh, there were industries built in those counties, or if it's an agricultural area, have more profitable um, endeavors mm -hmm. that at least profit the youth and they're able to engage in that. Exactly. And uh, by the way, uh, if that was... if the as aspect of devolution would not be knocking, uh, would not have knocked as of now, I think uh, the picture would be quite different. Mm. Because I'm sure v I'm, I've gone across all the counties and I'm sure they are doing a good job in terms of providing security unto their citizens. And I, I find it, uh, you know, uh, very reasonable to say that uh, the levels as of today are quite different as of levels when devolution was in it, not in place. Mm. Uh, but again, when it comes to matters of uh, security, I think we also need to separate which kind of security. We have security which is based on matters of terrorism, which is at high level in terms of national scope. And we also have, uh, you know, local security, which is as, as a result of uh, lawlessness, which is no more as a result of people being idle, having no job opportunities, and uh, having nothing to keep themselves busy. And also, there's also the political connotation in terms of security, where there is issues of incitement by some of the political class. But that seems not to be a working of late because of the political temperatures having gone down a little bit. And therefore, we cannot uh, per se attribute a political hand when it comes to rising security issues. But to me, these are security <coughs> issues which are, you know, as a result of matters of uh, unemployment, mm -hmm. idleness, drug abuse, and other attributing factors. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, let's now take a look at page seven and look at matters politics. And uh, if we can scroll to page seven, 
Baka, Ruto Bakas defy Uhuru. And, uh, well, of course, there is Martes 2022 already taking center stage. And as much as uh, there was the political rhetoric that after the elections, well, we should give time, time for development to be done. But it looks like it's very difficult for us to ignore 2022. But there you go. Apparently, Ruto Bakas defying Uhuru. Absolutely. Uh, you, uh, human beings are, polit uh, are political in nature, so is uh, what uh, some of the philosophers would say. Mm. And uh, you cannot uh, separate them from politics of the day simply because that's their game. That's what, they, that was, that's what puts bread on their table. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, uh, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a good call to, you know, uh, cool down a little bit in terms of political temperatures, uh, owing to the fact that we are coming from a situation which was not so good for us mm -hmm. as a country, for the economy and so on and so on, national cohesion as well. So I think it's a good call for us to turn a little bit in terms of politics and give uh, dialogue a chance, give development and the growth some chance. But uh, because politics is part of part and parcel of our human being, mm -hmm. we cannot run away from it. But uh, when it comes to you know succession politics, of course. Uh, these guys have to put themselves in a situation that they are looking more attractive. And when, it looks, when you look at the persona of uh, one uh, William Ruto, currently is the man to beat. And uh, people have to play in a way that they are looking to be warming up to him simply because he's the man to beat. So they might, they might start early so that they could uh, look good in the, in the eye of the DP uh, because of uh, the goodies that are attached to you know, being associated with some, uh, such a person who has a high potential of rising to the to highest the office on land. Exactly. Absolutely. So that might be a strategy that they apply. And uh, well, of course, being uh, second in command gives him a very good starting point, mm -hmm. almost a head start exactly. uh, when it comes to the eyeing the price. Let's finish off with page 15 of uh, the standard and this is to do with a film uh, Rafiki was KFCB justified in banning Kenyan made movie titled Rafiki we did have the uh, director of the film Wanori Kahyu with us on Friday basically giving us a rundown of what the film is on and the fact that it's been uh, nominated uh, to feature in the Cannes Award which is going to be taking place in France but the KFCB coming out to ban the film. A Kenyan a film done by Kenyans, made by Kenyans. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I've been following such kind of uh, episodes by one uh, Zekiel Mutua, who is a big brother when it comes to matters of morality and legality. And uh, of course, uh, the Kenyan industry in terms of movies and so on, the art industry for that matter, of course, it's still uh, at its infantry stage. And therefore, we do not uh, need to have so many bottlenecks that perhaps are going to jeopardize our our quest to grow to the likes of uh, Nollywood and Hollywood and so on and so on, or Bollywood for that matter. Uh, <coughs> seems to be doing a good job when it comes to matters of moral policing. Uh, but you also need to, uh, to ensure that he also offers that conducive environment for the industry to grow, other than putting bottlenecks every day and every day. Uh, but of course, uh, this, this movie of Rafiki, of course I did follow some of the issues that uh, were raised that it was actually propagating issues to do with the lesbianism. And uh, this country being uh, so morally upright, well, let me put it that way, uh, you find that uh, matters of uh, GBVT, matters of gender, uh, issues of uh, homosexuals, gays, and, those, and so on, and heterosexuals, for that matter, has very small room in this country when it comes to appreciating their space in this country or their place in this country. So I think it would be important for us to start opening up and start accommodating these people and articulate what uh, you know makes them think as a society because they are part of us they are our daughters they are our children they are yeah, husbands they are our hus uh, husbands and so on and so on so for me i think uh, rafiki perhaps would have uh, a good chance for us as a country to see the other picture of uh, what this kind of relationship is and all about and perhaps to start seeing a different picture to what we normally have as far as uh, this kind of uh, uh, same sex uh, you know relationship is concerned mm. so maybe for matters of morality perhaps it would have given an opportunity perhaps uh, for people to see the other side of that uh, you know picture and at the same time you know give us as our citizens an opportunity to appreciate this kind of special 
or group or formation within our Mideast as a country. All right, and I'm sure that debate continues and it was trending pretty much over the weekend. But let's now change over and take a look at the nation where we've already looked at the headlines. But for the benefit of anybody who's joining us now, that is the headlines right there. Uh, team reveals agenda of Uhuru Raila's deal. And this is to do, of course, with the handshake now beginning to gain form. But let's move up a little bit. And uh, there's a different story right there. If you can just scroll this up a bit and you you have an issue there to do with, for Kenyan mothers, apparently uh, life is hard and dangerous. And this is because majority of them cannot afford, um, you know, gynecological uh, care for their children. But again, of course, we do know when a lady is pregnant, it can become a very dangerous journey, both for the mother and the child. Three to six, the average number of hours most women wait to see a gynecologist. There is actually a story that has been reiterated there. Uh, of a lady who went to see a gynecologist at 1.45 p.m., but ended up seeing the doctor at 7 p.m. So, of course, it is, uh, again, an issue to do with the numbers of gynecologists vis-a-vis uh, -vis the number of women who would need the service of a gynecologist. It, it's a worrying trend, uh, Michael, I'm afraid to say, because when you look at the number of uh, you know, medical specialists who have left mm. our country going mm. for greener pastures is a worrying trend because this issue of brain drain, um, you know, good professional members leaving our country for better, uh, for, uh, for better services and better pay elsewhere, mm. it's something that needs to be tamed as a country. I think we need to find a way of uh, ensuring that this uh, lot is actually confined within our, you know, our country uh, by improving their working conditions, their salaries and remunerations, and so on and so on. But you realize that we spend a lot of money uh, teaching or educating these fellas, making them what they are, and at the moment they graduate, they get opportunities and they are snatched in different countries. So mm. they leave us with a lot of vulnerabilities, they leave us with a, uh, very much exposed, and that's why you see such a case is a, is a case study that perhaps they need to, you know, bring our, you know, our country in terms of dialogue when it comes matters of Healthcare. Healthcare in Kenya. It is a very gloomy picture for us. Uh, but I think, uh, Michael, it's also something that uh, I would want to loud Makweni County because they have set the stage uh, for universal you know, healthcare, healthcare. And I've shown the world that it's doable through one uh, Governor Kivuta Kibwana, who has actually shown how it can be done. <coughs> so if that can be replicated at the national level, where you know members, uh, these professionals are well paid, they are well tamed, they are within the convent, and they are available to attend to their people. I think this is something that we can borrow from that uh, uh, concept of Makweni universal health care. All right. And, uh, you know, make it a national issue. Okay, let's also look at page 12 of the Daily Nation today. This is the subject that we are going to be handling later on on our The Way It Is. Uh, page 12, and this is to do with matters education and higher education for that matter. And uh, crackdown on striking dawns begins as scores suspended. So uh, the strike has been going on now for quite a while. There doesn't seem to be light at the end of the tunnel. And it looks like, uh, well, the whip is just about to be cracked a little bit harder on them. Uh, uh, it's, it's a sad picture there to see lecturers being sacked for demanding what is duly right for them. And I'm a victim of the same because, Michael, uh, as you are aware, I've also been teaching at the universities. And uh, one of the you know, forgotten lot are the part-time lecturers who n have nothing to complain as much as they are working and as much as they are, you know, they want to, you know, make their CV look better. But you realize that they are forgotten lot because mm. they never get paid. Somebody works for, 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 in for example, January, April semester. And this person will get his pay after two years. Where do you, how do you expect this person to, to, to survive? Mm. And therefore, this, I think, uh, matters of education, especially higher education in this country, Michael, mm -hmm. uh, w uh, you know, calls upon some sort of uh, concerted efforts, dialogue, and putting our heads together mm. to understand where is the problem and how do we move or gravitate ourselves from this kind of, uh, you know, a recurring sort of, uh, you know, Issues. issue, phenomena, which has been uh, ever since, uh, you know, we attained independence as a country. But you look at a professor who has actually spent most of his entire life, you know, doing research and uh, improving his, uh, you know, academic abilities, only to be paid a uh, patron 90,000 or less than 100,000. Mm. When somebody, an MCA who has no even standard aid certificate, gets paid gets over paid. almost half a million. A lot more. And that's, a, uh, that's a conversation <laughs> that we're going to be having on the way it is this morning. Uh, but we'll have to wind up right there because of time. Thank you very much, Brian Moutier, who is so a much. governance expert, for joining us this morning. Just to 
we're going to look through some of the stories making headlines on the dailies. Well, at this point in time, we're going to take a break. But uh, for ATN Home viewers, it's not so much a break, but a change for KTN Home. It's going to be laugh and style that is going to begin in just a bit. For those of us on KTN News, well, we continue looking at some of those stories making headlines, but also we'll be looking at university education in Kenya. Uh, right here on the way it is. And of course, we have a mushrooming of universities that has taken place in the country. And does that work for us or does it work against us? We also have uh, the lecturer strike uh, that we have alluded to just now that has taken place for a long time. It's been protracted for a while. Meanwhile, students are still at home waiting for that to be done. But there you go. That's a discussion we're going to be having on the way it is right here on Morning Express. For Katie and home viewers, goodbye. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing. For Katie and News, we take that break. We'll be right back back. This is KTN News. Codeine cough syrup is creating an opioid addiction crisis in Nigeria. At least three million bottles are drunk every day. But how does the syrup get from pharmaceutical companies to drug dealers? Undercover journalist Rona Meyer exposes the criminals behind the scam and the damage being done to millions of young people. Africa Eye, sweet, sweet codeine. Nothing stays 